Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Singularity Podcast. Singularity Podcast is a feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. Today, my guest at the show is John Horgan. John Horgan is a science journalist and director of the Center for Science Writings at the Stevens Institute of Technology at Hoboken, New Jersey. A former senior writer at Scientific American, he has also written for the New York Times, Time, Newsweek, The Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, and many other publications around the world. At present, John writes, um, John writes for the Crosscheck blog for Scientific American, does video chats for bloggingheads.tv, and writes a column for BBC Knowledge. I have to mention also that many of John's publications have received international coverage, including front page reviews and news articles. His first book, The End of Science, Facing the Limits of Science in the Twilight of the Scientific Age, was a bestseller translated into 13 languages. His follow-up, The Undiscovered Mind, How the Human Brain Defies Replication, Medication and Explanation, was a finalist for the 2000 British Mind Book of the Year, and has been translated into eight languages. John is probably the best known critic of both Ray, Ray Kurzweil and the technological singularity, and it is for this reason that I wanted to invite him here at Singularity Weblog so that he can present his views on our topic. So without further ado, let me welcome John Horgan at Singularity Podcast. Welcome, hey, nice John. To be. Thank you. Nice to be here. I, I, um, I'm certainly a critic of the singularity. I, I have never heard before that I was the best known critic, uh, but uh, I guess that's a compliment. But, so thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. And again, it is our privilege to have you here. Um, we would like to include the whole, the full spectrum of the debate, a healthy debate on the singularity, of course, includes both the optimists and the pessimists, and let our viewers make their own mind for themselves. So thank you for uh, taking time to do this with us. My pleasure. Excellent. So let me start um, with the big picture and ask you to share a little bit about your background, maybe so that people familiarize yourself, uh, themselves with you, and especially how you got interested in um, examining and analyzing the progress of science in general. Well, I'm an English major, um, for starters, uh, but I've always been interested in science. I, um, when I was a kid, half the time I wanted to be a writer, half the time I wanted to be a scientist, and then I realized eventually I could be a science writer and um, satisfy uh, both these interests. And actually, one of the reasons I wanted to become a science journalist was because of some of the singularity-like prophecies that were being made in the early 80s when I was <laughs> at uh, Columbia. I was an undergraduate at Columbia and then went to uh, the School of Journalism there in the early 80s. I graduated in uh, 1983. And just as an example, I took a course from a writer named Pamela McCordick, who wrote a very influential book called Machines Who Think. I think it came out in 82 or so. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the book was about how computers were going to take over the world. It was about some of the predictions coming out of Japan and the United States primarily about these tremendous advances in artificial intelligence. And McCordick had uh, interviewed uh, Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy and Hans Moravec and a lot of the, uh, the leaders of artificial intelligence. And they were basically saying that computers were just about to race past us in intelligence and they were going to be these amazing transformations of humanity and uh, and possibly computers, robots, whatever, were going to leave us in their cognitive dust and create a whole new super intelligent species. I thought that was really far out. Um, and that was one of the uh, inspirations for me in becoming a science writer. That sounded so exciting that I wanted to uh, cover it. So that's that's amazingly interesting. You started with uh, a whole lot of enthusiasm and optimism about the singularity as a possibility, and then eventually, in time, you turned into a critic. Yeah, you know, I should mention that uh, this is maybe uh, giving away a little bit too much about my background, but all another 
other instrumental factor was that I had a, um, a dr drug trip. So I'm, I'm sort of an old, um, an old hippie. And I grew up in the 60s, and I dabbled in psychedelics. And I had a trip in, um, I think it was 1981. I've written about this. And, in fact, I think I, I mentioned it at the Singularity Summit a couple of years ago. Yeah, I was um, watching that video. Okay. Yeah. Well, in the trip, I felt like I became this cosmic computer at the end of time, a, a, a computer that uh, filled out the whole universe and uh, could basically calculate or imagine any reality and uh, that as well as what I was reading uh, about artificial intelligence and hearing from my teacher Pamela McCordick um, also led me to have uh, have a real fascination with these sorts of possibilities and uh, and my first uh, job in journalism was for an engineering magazine IEEE Spectrum which was covering artificial intelligence. And it was covering some of the, the crazy research that was being supported by uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, they were trying to uh, create autonomous robots that could be soldiers and go out and, and shoot people. And so no, no real humans would get killed. Well, the, they would kill humans, but uh, <laughs> good guys uh, could just stay at home in their offices. And uh, so it was a combination of this actual vision that I had uh, and science fiction um, and what I was reading uh, that made it seem as though all this was actually going to happen that uh, that pulled me into this field. So would you say that your original motivation that pulled you into the field was uh, spiritual or scientific or general curiosity or what, what was the, the main motive you would say? I'd say it was all of the above. Uh, I, I think uh, people who are familiar um, with my writings, uh, starting with my first book, The End of Science, I can see that um, that my interest in science has a kind of, I guess, spiritual dimension to it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, so I was a lapsed Catholic and then became a not quite a, an atheist, but an agnostic. And I, I saw science as possibly uh, providing a kind of spiritual fulfillment that traditional religions uh, couldn't. So that definitely was, um, was part of my interest in all these things too. But also it was, there was this hardcore materialist in me, the journalist in me that just thought these were some of the most exciting things happening on the planet. Uh, so it was all a mix of these different motivations. That's that's incredibly interesting, and I have so many questions I want to ask. How you started as a complete optimist and enthusiast, and ended up writing a book such as *The End of Science*, for example. But before that, I just want to dig a little bit deeper into your uh, fundamental or spiritual self. Now, you've already briefly touched that you started off as a Catholic. Can you tell us a little bit more about your religious affiliations, past or present, and where you're at in terms of religious, uh, in religious terms at the moment, but how you started it and where, where you are at right now? Well, I grew up in kind of a soft Catholic family. Uh, my dad would drag us to church now and then, but um, uh, he didn't take it all that seriously. I guess I was a pretty good Catholic boy until I was maybe 12 or so, and then I started thinking about some of the things that we were uh, learning in catechism, and they just seemed um, silly to me. And uh, I was starting to read a lot. As I said, when I became a teenager, I kind of got involved in um, in some of these uh, alternative forms of spiritual seeking that emerged in the 60s. Uh, I got interested in Eastern mysticism. I got interested in psychedelic drugs. I was doing those sorts of things at the same time as I was reading a lot of uh, Aldous Huxley, for example. He was a big influence on my, uh, on my thinking. And I guess the way this relates to science is um, I was uh, really intrigued by the idea of there being out there somewhere a kind of revelation where you could really know what was going on in this world, uh, a kind of enlightenment, mm -hmm. uh, a really higher consciousness. Nirvana. Nirvana that could be achieved by meditation or by psychedelic drugs or maybe intellectually and by science. by science. So uh, 
in the in the early 1980s, you probably remember also Stephen Hawking and some other people were starting to talk about the, the possibility of a final theory of physics that would also represent the culmination of our uh, quest to know what the hell is going on here, where did the universe come from, what's the purpose of existence, and all those sorts of things. A complete theory of everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was part of the mo motivation. I, I should say another big... So what happened there? You started off as a soft Catholic, uh, then you moved on to like, as you mentioned, being a hippie, embracing the, the time of the 60s, etc. Uh, trying some psychedelic drugs, then how did your religious uh, awareness or embracing of religious ideas evolve from there? Did you, what was the next step? Did well, you abandon I, Catholicism completely? Did you become agnostic or a complete atheist? Did you become a Buddhist because you mentioned Eastern mysticism? I'm, I'm fascinated by, by all forms of religion. I, I'm not religious in any conventional way anymore. I, I call myself an agnostic because Reality seems much too weird to be totally uh, a random, a, a total coincidence that that that, um, that has no purpose or or uh, meaning. There just there's too much of a narrative, too much drama to existence for me to completely be an atheist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, but I haven't found any theology that makes any sense to me. So I'm always out there looking for people's crazy ideas to find a, try to find something that makes sense. And I guess because I'm, I'm sort of an asshole, I, I you know, I, I'm fascinated in ideas and then I, I find them and then I look into them and then I decide that they're really pretty dumb, just as dumb as Catholicism was. And then I go on to the next thing. Uh, but I should say that my skepticism is informed. What happened, what turned me from a, an optimist to a pessimist was that I became a science journalist and I learned what was actually going on in science. And I realized that um, the predictions about super intelligent machines and all that kind of stuff were just science fiction fantasies that were very poorly grounded in uh, reality. That really started happening in the late 1980s. And uh, I became equally pessimistic about the prospects for a final theory of physics that would explain where the universe uh, came from. So I'm an equal opportunity skeptic.